the recession that will change a generation. Now recession, it's the word everyone in finance fears. Even worse is the word thought of going into a depression, as in the Great Depression, something none of us have ever seen. Now for the last 14 years, the United States has seen the longest secular bull market in history, other than the short and severe dip back in March of 2020 through the pandemic and the economy being shut down, the U.S. markets have returned over 350% for just buying, holding, and staying in. But now, that's over. And it looks like it's time to get used to a new time for a new generation. So in this video, I'm going to break down what drove the longest bull run in history and why it's over, what the damage is that's already been done, what more damage is about to come, a potential catalyst that could see the entire market crash, what the experts are saying, and what the new generation has to look forward to. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you have learned is wrong. And so I'm trying to take complex subjects. It makes them easy to understand. Try to parse through the information, the media is spinning on you so you know what's happening. And today we're going to look at potentially the end of a generation and what comes next. So let's dig into this. So the first thing is, as we talked about, uh, the paradigm we've been in, you have to understand this so you can understand the paradigm we're going into. And so we have a secular bull run. Now I've been talking about secular bull runs versus cyclical runs, cyclical, mar cyclical markets. Um, the secular bull run has been the longest bull run in history, the longest market that's been going straight up. So it's a bull run, which of course we have a guy riding a bull right here. And we basically have it for about 12 years from 2010 through 2022. And I have a chart right here. You can see what this looks like. I'll pull it up. This is the longest secular bull run in history. And so here we have the 2008 great financial crash. But as we started coming back up from that, you can see the support line and it has been a secular bull run. So what does that mean? Well, there's been dips. So here we have a dip of 16%. Here we have a dip of 21%. Here we have a dip of about 15 and percent. Then when Volcker, I'm sorry, not Volcker, uh, when uh, Powell at the Fed tried to pull back the reins and increase rates, the markets didn't like it. They dropped 20% right here. We had the March 2020 crash, which was an anomaly. We can kind of get that one out. And here we are sitting at 24% down, broken um, through right here. So this is the longest bull run in history. And what's important to look at this, and the reason why I put this up is so each one of these have been by the dip moments because we've been in this long bull run. So your financial advisor tells you it's not time in the market, it's just time in the market. The markets always go up. Yeah, they go down sometimes, but just continue to hold, right? That's what they tell you. And it has been right over this last bull run, but that's the old paradigm. Like I said, things have changed. Now, if we keep going, we can see that it's been driven by something called the Fed put. Of course, I've talked about this many times. You shouldn't be a surprise to you. Basically, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, has been willing to continue to push the markets up. So they always had your back. You knew if the markets were down, you could still buy because you knew they were going to push it back up for you. And it's worked out pretty well. It's been that way since about 2008, which is when the world changed. It's when we were first introduced to something called QE or quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is a form of monetary policy. It quickly increases the domestic money supply, which spurs economic activity. Who would have thought that you just, uh, you know, throw a whole bunch of money out there that uh, economic activity would pick up? Like, who would have thought, right? And of course, that's exactly how it works. It's like Ben Bernanke was talking about this helicopter money, basically throwing money out of a helicopter to spur this activity. Now, it involves a country's central bank purchasing longer-term government bonds as well as other types of assets such as MBS or mortgage-backed security. So it's not like they just print a bunch of cash and dump it out of a helicopter. That's a hypothetical uh, joke. Uh, what it does involve is the central bank buying bonds and by also buying mortgage-backed security. So by doing that, it increases the money supply that's out there in the market. And so in 2008, we saw that new policy happen in the United States. And since then, um, it's been quite an effective tool. What we can see in this chart right here is in this 2008 great financial crash, we had long-term treasuries that were kind of steadily growing. 
We have the short medium term treasuries here. These, this gray is the mortgage backed securities. We've seen how much that's grown. And then this is just other stuff that the Federal Reserve has done. In addition to buying these mortgage backed securities and these bonds, what they've also done is they've continued to lower the Fed funds rate, the interest rate that the Fed charges. And of course, when rates are lower, people borrow more. When they borrow more, there's more money created. And so we can see right here, um, every time they have tried to raise rates, the markets crashed. These gray areas are market crashes. So they raised rates, you can see the markets crashed. So they had to lower the rates. They finally were in good times, they tried to raise rates, and then they, tried, then, then they brought them back down, it wasn't so good, they tried to raise rates again, and then, see the gray area? The markets crashed, they had to bring them back down. They finally tried to raise rates again, didn't work, crashed the market again. After 2008, you can see rates are at the bottom. That's at zero percent. How much lower can you lower them? That's like the nuclear weapon. It's all in at that point. They're at zero. They finally tried to raise them a little bit. Here we go. And the markets don't like it. And guess what? Here we have another crash. So that's basically been our history since 2008. That's been the Fed put that we're talking about. Every time it's happened, the Fed has bailed us out. You can see a better picture of this. And so we have the stock market and this is the Fed balance sheet that has just ballooned by them pumping that money into the market. Now, that has been the way it's been. But now we have a new problem. A new problem is that uh, the Fed was saying they could continue to put all this money out. They can continue to pump this up because it wasn't causing inflation. They can create all this money and they weren't getting inflation. Now remember, the Fed has a target of 2% inflation. What does that mean? <laughs> what it really means is that they want your money to lose 2% of its purchasing power per year. Think about that. They want you to lose purchasing power every year, but they said they couldn't get it. Now, in a day like today where we have raging inflation, it's hard to maybe remember this. So let's go all the way back here to 2019. And here the Fed may soon let inflation run a little hotter than usual, Goldman Sachs says. It says to consider alternative approaches to targeting inflation, central banks will decide to allow overshoots of inflation goal next year. So back then, they couldn't get inflation. No matter how much money they printed, they couldn't get inflation. Now, never mind that house prices were going up, stock prices were going up, Bitcoin and gold were going up. Never mind that. That's not really inflation. Those are assets. They're talking about consumer price inflation. Gas was still cheap. They didn't like that. They wanted it to go up in value, so you lost money. And so they were going to try new things. Since 2012, the Fed has always been attempting to hit a 2% target but inflation has fallen short. They just couldn't get enough of your purchasing power to go away. They couldn't get that number no matter what they did since 2012. The alternative approach encourages higher prices during expansions. Now that was um, 2019 and here we have 2020, sort of the same thing. You might remember this if you watch the channel pretty regularly. Uh, Fed time to let the inflation run hot. Let it run hot. What does that mean? Let's just we can't get the inflation, our, our target of 2%, we can't get 2%, let's just overshoot it. Let's go to 5%. Well, how about 8.6% 8 8 where we're at right now? So this is August 2020. The Fed has managed to do a lot of things through its fiscal stimulus policies. There's one thing, however, <laughs> one thing, however, it hasn't been able to do. It can't get inflation above its 2% target. It just can't get the inflation. It can't steal enough of your money. That was back in um, 2020. It had that problem. So you can see that, all right? <laughs> However, how have things changed? Well, let's take a look at this. Of course, you probably know that our latest CPI number was 8.6%. hasn't been this high since the 80s. And you can see this. This is uh, going back here till 2012. And this is just the food cost is the bright yellow line. And you can see it was pretty consistent at about 2%. So that means you're only losing 2% of your wealth to food every single year, you know, but at least it's consistent at 2%, not too bad. Uh, but what we can see now, uh, it's a li like a lighter line, is you can see just how high this inflation has raged today, and it is screaming high. Now, uh, if, we, if we look at this on a chart, you can see it compared, uh, here we are right here, we're about 8%, so it hasn't been this high since the 80s. Now, it was higher in the 80s, don't get me wrong, but also, I'm not gonna go into this, but also the way they calculate CPI has changed a lot. If we go back to the way it was calculated back then in the 80s, it's actually over 17%. Now, 
like I said, this is creating the new paradigm. And because of this high inflation, the Fed now said, well, shoot, we, we couldn't get 2%. So now we're going to try everything we can. Let's throw the kitchen sink at it. And now we overshot. Now we got 8.6%. And now we're panicking because we got too much. And so now we have to crash everything back down again. So they're not operating with the precision of a surgeon with a scalpel. They have a hatchet. And they're just trying to hatch it and they're just going all over the place. They have no idea what they're doing. So now we're having carnage. Carnage. Now it's happened pretty quickly and pretty severely, so maybe you haven't picked up on it. But things are bad. Let's take a look at this. The NASDAQ, which of course has um, all the tech stocks, the growth stocks, has been completely demolished. Here you can see most of these tech stocks. We have Zoom down here, we have Shopify, we have DigitalOcean. Oh, we got a bigger chart. Let's pull it up here. Sorry about that. So you can see here Cloudfare, we got DocuSign, Teladoc, they're all down from 60%, 70%, 84%. Some of the darlings, the Wall Street darlings like Kathy Wood's ARK Fund, look at this. It looks like a, that's worse than cryptocurrency. It's down 75% right there. We have uh, everyone's favorite pandemic um, app, Zoom, is down 80%. Look at that. All, gave up all the gains it's made in the last couple years. Um, and these are big, well-known names. Here we have Shopify down 81%. So we have complete carnage that's happening. And like I said, we have it in cryptocurrencies are down. The bond market is completely blown up and it's actually even getting deeper. So if that carnage in the tech space, in the growth space, in the crypto, the bond market wasn't enough, what about the S&P 500? Well, the S&P 500 is balancing on a pin and it is about to go down, which will absolutely change everything. The S&P 500 uses a weighted system, a, a basket, and it has one stock that's basically holding it up. Now, if we take a look at the S&P 500, you can see what I'm talking about with this weighted basket. So here we have Apple. Apple makes up the majority of the S&P 500. We also have Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Facebook, all right? But Apple has done really well and it's kept the entire index up even though most of these companies, even Facebook, are down massively, but Apple's holding on. But what if Apple were to crash? What would happen to the S&P 500? It could be an absolute bloodbath. And why would I suggest something like that? Well, let's take a look at Apple. Um, so here we have a chart of Apple to take a look at it. So, uh, you know, it's holding up relatively well. Now, keep in mind a bear market is when prices drop by 20% or more. It's not like a hard and fast rule, but that's about the general makeup of it. And here we have Apple down 25%. So Apple is holding up good compared to Facebook and everything else in the S&P 500, but it is down massively 25%. But I think there's even more trouble ahead. As a matter of fact, there's big trouble in China. Uh, you may not be old enough to remember this. Uh, leave me a comment. Let me know. Are you old enough to know what this is before I say it? Uh, this is a movie called Big Trouble in Little China. With, uh, if you know about that, uh, go ahead and uh, leave me a comment. Oh, and while you're at it, you know, go ahead and hit that like button. And uh, if you're not already subscribed, you could hit that subscribe button too. All right. Now let's break this down. So Apple, um, you know, it's a publicly traded company and they have their um, investor meetings and their calls. And there was a, a recent call. Now, shout out to meet Kevin. Um, he's the one that broke this chart. I'm, I'm taking it from him. But they had a call and they said uh, basically what happened. I'm not going to read all this to you, but they kept um, asking them questions about their uh, their their profits and about their production and about their goals and forecasts for next year. And they kept dodging. They asked about consumer spending here. They asked about from an inflation point of view, are we seeing inflation in their products? They dodged that question. They asked about the um, the impact of of the consumers. They dodged that question from Tim Cook, the CEO. They asked him about um, if they're watching what happened uh, closely and if they're going to be able to adjust. He dodged that question here, um, and they just dodged, 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 which is kind of weird. Obviously, if you're not answering the question forthright, it leads people to think you might have something to hide. What could they be hiding? Because apparently Apple's doing really good, right? Well, not really. Remember, like I said, big, tr big trouble in little China. So 
as you uh, are probably aware if you watch this channel, and if you don't, again, click that subscribe button, but you should be aware if you watch this channel that China has massive problems, energy problems, food problems, um, water problems, and because of that, also they've had their entire nation, well not their entire nation, but most of Shanghai locked down. More people locked down than the United States even has people, about 400 million. Um, China's tech hub, Shenzhen, locks down 17.5 million residents, closing Apple factories and risking chaos in global supply chains. So if Apple can't produce products, that means they can't sell products. And if they can't sell products, then what happens to their forecasts? That's right, they go down. That's not good for earnings, is it? And it is a big problem in China. We can see here that Apple production halted at three key Chinese suppliers, hitting iPhone, iPad, and Mac. Now, you better believe that if Apple is getting shut down in China, there's lots of other companies being shut down first. So it's a bigger problem than most realize yet, but this is uh, the snake eating the proverbial rat. If this is happening in production, what's gonna happen to Apple sales? It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Now, Apple's trying to remedy the situation. Apple's looking to boost production outside of China. So now they're looking in India, they're looking in Southeast Asia, but that doesn't happen overnight. You don't just move your production and, and skip without skipping a beat. That doesn't happen. So if they have big trouble in little China or in big China, they are not able to produce their products. They're going to have to move their factories. That's going to be very expensive. It's going to cause more delays. And what's going to happen to their sales numbers? Uh, yeah, it's not going to be good. What's going to happen to their stock price? It's not going to be good. What's going to happen to the S&P 500? Yeah, if you're following along, you understand it's a big problem. So it's no doubt that we have many of the experts, experts calling for a recession. Now, sometimes you want to counter trade these people. In this instance, I'm agreeing with them. Jamie Dimon, maybe one of the most connected people in the world, the head of JP Morgan, uh, maybe one of the most influential people in the world. Um, he says that you better brace yourself, get ready, you better brace yourself. JP Morgan is bracing ourselves and we're going to be very conservative with our balance sheet. If he's doing it, you might want to be conservative with your balance sheet as well. He, in, he warns investors to brace themselves. That's what Jamie Dimon's saying. Now we can see here, if we look at the Fed funds rate, we can see that um, we keep getting these recessions every time they raise rates aggressively and we're raising rates very aggressively. What do you think comes next? Um, if you can spot patterns, probably an elementary kid could tell you exactly what comes next. And it's not just uh, reading the tea leaves or looking at a chart and trying to guess what's next. We have right here, we have former New York Fed chief Dudley. So former New York Fed chief, uh, he was head of the FMOC. He worked at Goldman Sachs. He's somebody you should be listening to. He says that the Fed, quote, must inflict more losses on stock markets. He says if the stocks won't go down, the Fed needs to drive them down. Why? Because something known as the wealth effect. When your house goes up in value and your stocks go up in value, you feel wealthy and you go spend a bunch of money. When your home goes down in value and your stocks go down in value, you feel poor and you don't spend any money. Remember supply and demand, inflation. If, they, if they're trying to get inflation down, they have two choices. Increase the supply. Turns out central banks can't print more food or energy. That's a problem. So then the other option is to decrease demand. It's called demand destruction. And so that's exactly what they're doing. That's why they want to inflict more losses. That's the new paradigm. Now the Fed's already doing it. All right, this is already being done. Uh, hopefully you're already been catching up to this. Of course, if you're watching this channel, you already are. They have already been raising rates. Surprise, surprise, we know that. Now, we want to look at this because we keep saying that inflation hasn't been as high since the 80s. Now, in the 80s, there's a lot of differences to that. But one of the things that keeps getting brought up is that Paul Volcker was head of the Fed at the time, and he raised interest rates from 10% to almost 20% over about a three-year period. All right, now we are also raising rates, so he raised them by 100%. The Fed has already raised rates by more than that in months, not years. So in terms of percentage moves, when the cost of service your debt doubles, the cost of your debt, the service of your debt doubles. It doesn't really matter if it's 10 to 20 or one to two, it's still a double that's being paid. Now we can see this really easy in some charts here. We have a two-year treasury yield and the Fed funds rate. You can see just how high that is spiking up. 
Now the bigger problem that we have compared to the 80s when Volcker did that is the amount of debt to GDP. So if we go back to the 80s, where the Reagan era was, where Paul Volcker was so heroic to double um, the Fed funds rate, uh, the debt was very low. Today we have d debt very, very high. And uh, that means when you increase the um, interest rates, the debt becomes almost unmanageable. As a matter of fact, if they raise it to 3%, at $31 trillion of debt, quick math tells you it's about a trillion dollars just to service the debt. On top of that, remember the goal is to destroy demand. So we can also do it in real estate. Here we have mortgage rates. This is the borrowing cost, and we can see that it's the biggest one week increase in mortgage uh, prices since 1987. I believe we're actually up about here right now. It's moving so fast the chart can't even catch up. We're at about six and a half percent. Just a few months ago, when I bought a place in January, it was still under 3%. So it's more than it's gone up more than 100% in just a couple of months. Now, this is something you might have seen before. It's called the misery index. This is the unemployment rate plus, uh, plus inflation plus mortgage rates. Now, <laughs> this misery index is at about 18.5%. So it's a 3.6 unemployment, 8.6 CPI, 6.3 mortgage rate equals 18.5%. The misery index right here is extremely high for where we've been all the way back to, this is the 70s right here. Even in 2008, which is right here, we're even higher than we were in 2008. The great financial crash, the great recession. Now, the Fed is uh, hoping, maybe they're praying for a soft landing. What does that mean? Well, they're hoping they can bring down inflation without crashing the market, but I would say they already have. I already showed you all the tech stocks, all the tech darlings, they're down by 80%. Cryptocurrency is down 60, 70, 80%. Mortgage rates are up by more than 100%. I already think we're past the soft landing. Rather than praying that they can land on a very soft field and a very soft landing, it's more like they're trying to fly a jumbo jet and land it on a tightrope in the middle of a hurricane. It ain't gonna happen. So, most likely, stagflation. What does that mean? We have prices continuing to go up while growth goes down. It's not a good combo. Why would prices continue to go up? Well, remember, the Fed can't print more of the things we need. They can't print more food. They can't print more energy. And so they can't add more. All they can do is continue to destroy demand. But the problem is, as they continue to destroy demand, it actually causes other things to go up in value. Because again, it's, it creates more shortages there. And so stagflation is our most likely target. Now, will this time be different? We've had stagflation in the past, back in the 70s, back when Paul Volcker had to deal with it. Could this time be different? Because like I said, they're trying to land a jumbo jet on a tightrope in a hurricane, and I don't think so. But I want to know what you think. Leave me a comment and let me know. Of course, give me a thumbs up with this video if you like it, and uh, subscribe to this channel if you're not already subscribed to it so I can keep trying to deliver this good content to you. And that's what I got for you today, all right? To your success, I'm out. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably going to really like this video right here and this video right here.